Welcome to The Gaze. I'm glad to be with you on the digital platform of New Europe, platform where we will show you all the significant events in different regions uh, that, at the end of the day, affects the world globally. And we will speak about it with our experts for you. So I'm Ksenia Smirnova, and it's my show, Talk for More Details. And today we will speak about sports in politics and politicians in sport or politics in sport and we'll talk about this with Yaroslav Popovich is a former professional cyclist nice to meet you yes. hello so I want to begin my um, discussion with you with a simple question is there politics in sports and sport and politics how does it manifest on your point of view normally in all uh, our life for sports uh, I, I was ex-sports riders. Now I am working the, in the team, uh, like sport director in the cyclist team. And uh, all the time, especially in Europe, it was always like saying sport is not politics, politics is not in the sport, but it's really not true because <laughs> this was always inside. It was two things together, working all the life. Even if we go to the direction um, when I was young, in, in Ukraine, when I was the sports school, uh, the all the money for support the sport that was from the politic, from the government. Uh, till now, for this is not like uh, in Europe. If you go, you can see you have the um, clubs. Uh, like uh, we can talk a lot of about the cyclists. You have the clubs who sponsoring the the teams, and they uh, perform in the races. Uh, especially in our country, still the, the politic, this is the government, the city, uh, the small villages, and only in the past some years we tried to introduce the sponsors uh, to give the money for the sports. But now we have obvious uh, um, reasons for this. We are in war, so maybe in future we will talk about all the improvements in this situation. But I have very, I'd say, maybe ethical question, but still very difficult for the sportsman. Uh, do athletes have a choice? That's how I called my question uh, uh, preview. How is uh, um, the choice between a dream the goals of the Olympics or the World Championship, the fame and the appreciation of well-deserved work in exchange for loyalty to the hired leaders of your state, of your country, and the uh, sacrifice of all of this in exchange for dedication to your country and your people. This is an ethical question, but it's your point of view. I will always say and uh, this like divide the things before the war or before with the TGP, with the Russia, before the Russia, Ukrainian independ independence, and now timing. This was always the things to choice. Before, Ukrainian, Belarusian, Moldavian, all the, the this athletes not have the choice. I, I, not, I would not pass this time uh, like professional riders who start to go outside of the of the Russia to go to the Europe, but I hear a lot of stories like every time the KKGB, KKGB, KGB, 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 they was uh, because I, tra I translate in many languages for this. FSB, <laughs> that's how I understand FSB. everything. Everybody, yeah. <laughs> Yes, they have all the always the people around the sport uh, who sportsmen who go in, outside of the country. They always was present with them. Already in my age, when I'm start to go going outside of Ukraine, it was not nothing like this. It was really easy for this. We start to to be uh, sportsmen with another mentality. We start to be more strong. It's like in my age, uh, we was like uh, study Ukrainian literature, Russian literature, you, uh, again, the Russian language, Ukrainian language. After we have choice, after 92, we have choice to what we want to do. Same start with the, with the, with the sportsmen. And what I see, a lot of sportsmen can have his choice what to do and how to perform or perform with the Russian or not. Uh, we have like really nice example some days ago mm -hmm. <laughs> this was the best things forever because everyone started already forget uh about the war you know the people in europe they already like ah, it's, it's 
almost not nothing happened because it's normal things already for years. Uh, for this, it was really nice to see this with the uh, with the Halan. And uh, I think this gives us some uh, wake up, wake up call. And uh, like what we see already in many countries, the, the the Russian teams they try to escape the, all the the persecution. What they do about them? Like example, I can talk only about the cyclist because I'm working the cyclist team, and like they take the license of a Portuguese team or Spanish team. And they ride like all together in the same uh, in the same races like in other riders. It's just, this is not okay, but they try to to find some escape. We will uh, surely discuss this case a little bit later, but I want to resume our conversation about the possible future um, uh, uh, examples uh, of the best examples of European uh, countries, uh, how to, uh, I would say, break this dark circle when there's the influence of state structures and sports uh, on the civil position uh, of the athletes, uh, on example of European countries, because you spend a lot of time, a lot of time in Italy, you took place in the Tour de France, you uh, spent time, as I understand, in, in, in Spain, so you have lots of experiences. From the best experiences of Europe, except for these athlete clubs, as you just mentioned before, what else can be taken from that experience and uh, implemented here in Ukraine after the war to break this connection between politicians and between uh, uh, Olympic Committee, for example? Uh, a lot of depends of different sports, different uh, um, European even awards um, federation who who command them. It also depend a lot of the country. If you can see in the experience of the last uh, years from where the world is rock star, if you see Estonia, Latvia, Lat Lithuania, Poland, Poland, this you have the strong country who is against Russia full gas. They say no events, no sportsmen uh, from the from this country. And you see another country who do like this, you know, yes. they open, close their eyes. And uh, uh, like mm -hmm. we can see like uh, Hungary or even uh, some, some another country who, who can close a little bit eyes. Yes, and uh, also it's different is it's different sport for example in the in the cyclist we not have the Russian sportsmen who uh, perform in the high level for this is easy easy to not, not take them um, the start with them and also in Ukraine we not have enough of riders who can compete with with them in the one group you know but in the level uh, a little bit uh, down level yes you have this um this problematics uh but this also depends or um organizer invite the russian teams or russian the uh racers mm -hmm. cyclists and you need to decide or you go fight against them or you stay at home and you sacrifice your athletes it's you know, you, you put the two things in the scale and uh, depend what to do. But with the Ukrainian Federation, and we decide like a national team not can take the start with the Russian uh, riders. This is only things. When you go with the club, it's different. It's already accept of the rider because the club pay you money, uh, they provide your salary and you need to take your decision but the problem with the professional guys if you not take the start for three four four or five times team can say bye bye you risk your life you risk your career you have family you can give them uh, salary money you know this is always uh, the big things what everyone can can uh, or need to think 
Talking about people, ordinary people, uh, viewers and maybe fans of the sports uh, of other countries that might be affected by the civil position of some sportsmen, of athletes, you spend a lot of time, a lot of time, as I mentioned already, in Italy. And uh, at the beginning of uh, the war, you saw a great support from Italians towards Ukrainians. And how do you see uh, the situation changes? Because talking to the experts from other countries, we see that this support uh, much higher than it was at the beginning of the school uh, full-scale invasion. No, now support for sure has gone down like 90 percent, even 95. Uh, this in the moment when the war started, I was fully, fully for three months out of the of the, my job. I was uh, completely done for the for the help for humanitarian help to Ukraine, and uh, and people was amazing. I never saw in my life Italians, you know, because I was living in Italy for a long time. I never saw Italians to be um, so generous, uh, so help, helpful for one country. But from another side, it's understandable. You, you understand this because. All Ukrainian women for many, many, 20 years, 25, they was living in Italy. They helped grandma, mama, a sister of this Italian. They married with Italians, you know, this full of people, Ukrainian here. Because this, when I was there working this hub, uh, was always was Ukrainian women with Italian men, they bring the things, you know, and also the normal people was, but this was amazing. I, I tell you, I was living for this three months, it's like in one, like this, not sleep, not do nothing, not eat, I lose a lot of kilos, uh, but working, working, working. Now is everything like normal is going down, only some um, like uh, uh, normal people still helping, but only in the mirror things, you know, like uh, if uh, they need some medical things, okay, can help. You need this. It's not like before. It was everything. It was food, uh, clothing, uh, military things. Now it's very specific. Also, I had some requests from the people, you know, because I was, I was working especially with the medicine uh, to help the, the our military guys. And the, when we have some requests, I have still the people who, who work in this business. I try to help them. But it's not like like before. Uh, let's talk about the main decisions that uh, are made uh, in the uh, sports institutions and sport committees. Uh, from the latest information, the starting stage of the Giro d'Italia 2024 may take place in Ukraine. Uh, this uh, statement uh, uh, was made by the head of the Italian Foreign Ministry, Antonio Tagiani. However, according to the government officials, such development will become a reality if the situation allows. So the Giro is one of the main competitions uh, in the world uh, of road cycling. My question to you, my question to you is um, why it is so important for us? Can you explain, please? These things, when I, when I hear the things, I think is really publicity things. <laughs> I want to be very straight. Okay. <laughs> it was publicity things, you know, because for organize the race, uh, this kind of race, it's really big work, and you not can decide like one day to do this, and in the country when still the war is going, and the unit can say it will be in one year, everything will be okay, mm -hmm. and you can provide a lot of uh, a lot of security still. Okay, it's possible, but <clears throat> for me, it's not it's not it's not true. But from another side, is the biggest things what can happen for the sport because it's a lot of publicity for the world already already. Everyone know what's, where is Ukraine, what is Ukraine, and what happened in Ukraine. It's not like three, four years ago. They okay, it's some country, some there, somewhere, somewhere. It's Kiev. Okay, no, nobody know nothing else. Now everyone know where where is this. It it will be the, the the greatest things for for the sports, for the publicity for Ukraine, and it will be really nice. But I not 
things I'm not believe they can happen in one year. <laughs> it's really like make me smile, <laughs> make me a little bit fun. Oh, but you know now everyone if want to do something, it will be in the high level. Say I'm helping Ukraine, or I'm doing for Ukraine. I'm doing this. Mm -hmm. it's, sometimes it's too much. <laughs> Let's talk about another competition and there's some uh, questions and uh, doubts what to do with Belarus and Russian uh, uh, teams and uh, representatives and this uh, um, issue Russians uh, will uh, hurt chances of hosting events. Uh, David Lapartien claims that the government does not trust the cycling organization to ensure Russian and Belarusian athletes are competing at, uh, as neutrals before the World Championships in Scotland next month. Uh, the UK government has recommended that athletes from Russia and Belarus can only compete in Britain if they are self-funded and provide a private written declaration of neutrality to national governing bodies, stressing that they are not representing the uh, two regimes. According to British newspaper The Times, uh, the president, uh, David Lapatien, has issued a letter to the UK sports minister, Stuart Andrew, expressing concerns over the country's stance and accusing them of showing a lack of, a lack of faith in the background checks carried out by his organization. So is it a good example of affecting politicians on sport decisions so concrete and clear from this uh, uh, concrete case? No, it's always, I will say, I'm always like straight <laughs> in these things. If we say not, is not, they not can, uh, compete in, in any case because this country they destroy our country, they destroy our sport, uh, sports arena, they destroy family of our athletes, they destroy everything in our country. What uh, we can tell them only to sign the paper, what they not uh, like, uh, not uh, like with the war or something like this. This is not okay because I can say everything what I want in the paper or I can sign everything what I want, but after I'm support the war, I'm support everything. And uh, this is it's really complicated things. It's really complicated, but if we take decision, decision, we need to respect the decision and uh, till the war is not finished. Because mm -hmm. like I say before in this interview, the, the sport is always politics, it's always. <laughs> Even if you want to say not, it's, it's, it's like this. For this, they use, they use the country, they can, uh, even if this atlas will be be represented there, okay, they are not strong enough to, to, to do something. They will not win the race, they will not, uh, but still uh, the journalists, the commentators will be talk with them about them. If they will be not there, they will talk and they will say they have punished. <laughs> this is good things. In addition to this, on July 26, 2023, the uh, International Olympic Committee officially sent invitations to participate in the Olympic Games uh, in 2024 to 203 countries. Russia and Belarus are not on this list. Earlier, the International Olympic Committee announced that it will make a decision regarding the participation uh, of individual neutral athletes with Russian or Belarusian passports in accordance with the recommendations uh, for international federations and organizers of uh, international sports events. So my question is, is it possible and is it worth uh, to introduce specific rules for aggressor and occupier, uh, the country uh, in which athletes outside politics, really outside the politics if it's possible, will be able to take part provided uh, they do not support the regime and uh, that uh, mm, they uh, are, understand that their country is responsible in the criminal war against other independent states. Any, any rules can be provided and uh, implemented. They always, like, I, I talk about the, like, Put out the, the, the Russian from the uh, from the races for the athlete for the all the, the sports events, but 
from another side, I know the people who live already like many years in Europe, they have different mentality. They, they have the, their family, it's Europe, they, they against the war, but sometimes they not can say nothing because they have pressure from, from Russia, from Belarus, you know, but they really nice people, they understand everything for this. Uh, you have the, again the system. The, the, what what to, better to do? To, to give the chance to this person because they're really good person and you know them, or put them all in the one line. But now in this moment, uh, in this world of technology, of the WhatsApp, the Facebook, everything, you can check everything. You can you can control who the person, where they was, what they did, and which. Uh, political things they 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 talk you know yeah. it's it's really easy even i can i'm not really mm -hmm. big fan of the computer or everything but in five seconds i can find the political things of this person or the, another or the sports uh sportsman for this if can create this uh system system or even the people you know you need only two two persons who can follow this uh sportsman what they did what they say and you will e easy uh, say and see which if they really political person or not against or yes yeah i see but still i have very simple question to you you said just that these people uh, have a different mentality so they spend a lot of time in a different uh, european maybe american uh, uh, southern american uh, countries northern american countries whatever the people of the world, but still they uh, choose to represent uh, two of their native countries, I mean, Belarus and Russia. Why don't they just change the citizenship and represent the country that are not with the uh, criminal regime, for example? No, no, we, exactly. I know that can talk about the different sports, I, I say, because I'm, I work like really like only in cyclists. And we have the one riders in uh, World Tour, is Vlasov. He's from Russia. Uh, he almost, I, I don't want to say uh, one wrong thing, but I think he almost uh, born in France, like, or he lived in France from really, really like uh, baby. He immediately when this war starts, he changed the citizenship. Uh, he now, I don't know, he's under the, the, uh, the neutralized flag, but, because it's not so easy to change, you know. Uh, and uh, for this, uh, he's, he's okay. He's always say what he think because he was born here. He was thinking the thing, the things. You know, it's like uh, you can. This is why they not change. Mm -hmm. Why they not change? Why, why I'm not change? Never my passport, the Ukrainian passport to Italian. Because you're you're not representative of the country as a criminal country, you know, as a country of lesser country. But but it's you know like I don't want to say like really like uh, I'm I'm not changed because I, I I live in, in Italy for 22 years. I can change everything what I want in many years. But I was always with Ukraine with my heart. And I was always was proud to present my country. Is it uh, very difficult for you, for example, psychologically difficult to compete with the Russians? And uh, why uh, our sportsmen don't give up to compete? I mean, a press to take part in these uh, competitions when they have to compete uh, face to face with Russians? Now I'm really lucky because well, I'm really lucky because I don't compete anymore. I'm really lucky we don't have the Russian in the in the in the pro tour racing. But I tell you one story it was happened in Tour de France one month ago. Uh, I saw one Russian flag in one climb. Uh, I, I don't have time to stop because it was uh, be riders between me, between me and the other cars. It will be dangerous for everyone to to stop there and talk with with them, the, with these people to put put out this flag. But for the next day in the morning, I was driving the car and with me was Steven De Jong. He's from uh, Holland. I say Steven. Uh, today can happen one things then that they will kick me out of the car of the race. Say, why? Say, I, yesterday I saw the Russian flag and today I will be really, really like checking if I will saw this flag, I will jump out of the car. I will smash this flag out of this 
people. I will explain them, but can be happen something <laughs> difficult. But be careful if something happened. He was okay, Papa. Are you serious? I say, yeah, I'm serious. And he was all day like like this. I was searching, searching, but it was not anymore. This flag. <laughs> Uh, but, but still, you have an opportunity to do this uh, on your battlefields and the sport fields, uh, like Olga Haraland did it. So uh, you applaud uh, her decision to do what she did. And uh, let's uh, let remind our audience what happened then. So let's talk about the latest and one of the most famous incidents with Russian and Ukrainian sportsmen. Fencing championship in Milan. After the very first meeting of Olha Karlan from Ukraine and Anna Smirnova from Russia at the World Championship, Smirnova staged a provocation against Harlan. However, after the defeat, she was in no hurry to leave the track and demonstratively extended her hand to the Ukrainian to shake. Harlan refused to pressure her and offered her rival a blade to greet her only in this way. Before this, there were some changes in the regulations considering COVID, but anyways, Smirnova could not avoid defeat, but Harlan was also punished. It it's interesting detail. Uh, the president of uh, mm, this um, organization from 2008 until the beginning of the full-scale invasion of the Russian Federation in Ukraine was the pro-Kremlin oligarch Alisher Usmanov, who corrupted the Federation with his generous investments. In Milan, it was simply time for his former subordinates to practice them. So Halan herself called Smirnova's behavior after the battle a deliberate provocation. However, the organization uh, officials uh, did not anticipate the wave of outrage that would arise uh, over Halan's punishment. In the motherlands on the July 27, she turned into a national heroine in a matter of hours. And uh, the association of this uh, sport field social networks were attacked by outraged uh, Ukrainians. Even the Olympic Committee did not agree with the decision of uh, the organization and demonstratively, uh, demonstratively uh, qualified the Ukrainian woman for the Olympic Games 2024. So is it right time to change the rules in any way and how it may be? So can you show us your attitude towards uh, the decision of the Olympic Committee, the decisions of organization of this uh, uh, field of sport and Olga Haralan. What I said before, the not can say the political political is not the sport is sport. Not, it, it, this is really ex, ex, really best example what ha can happen like uh, in, in this moment, because everyone was talking like, no, no, like this, like, no, it's, it was always like this. Is this show how the political pushing to the to the sportsmen to do the one things or another things? And I'm really, really happy when this happened uh, to, to explode the, 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 the things what, what happened, you know, like uh, how is uh, people start to talk in Ukraine in the in Europe and uh, in the world. This was really nice. I was happy when this happened. <laughs> and after you see the like uh, reaction of the Olympic Committee and then other people and uh, about the rules, it's, they need to change everything. This is not the same world like like before. Yeah, we are changing the world, we are changing the rules, actually. It's obvious, uh, even in the sport field. So thank you very much for your position and thank you very much for this interview. And I want to uh, mm, remind our mm, audience that we had a chance to talk with uh, Yaroslav, Yaroslav Popovich. Um, it's a former professional cyclist. And now I'm glad to present my next guest. It's Vladislav Heraskevich, is the first ever Ukrainian skeleton racer. So hi. Hello. It's nice, nice to be here. 
Yeah, nice to have you here in our program. So we just talked about the situation with Olga Harlan, with uh, uh, your colleague, cyclist Yaroslav Popovich. And I want to ask you how you perceive all the news that arose within this situation. Uh, so first of all, uh, it's really nice to see uh, such a big support from uh, Ukrainian people to Olga. And uh, we all understand that now it's not uh, not in the top uh, it's not main topic of, of ukraine so main topic is the war first of all but it's nice to see that uh, everyone stand behind us behind athletes and uh, we see that uh, ukrainian people can change everything and uh, this uh, pressure what uh, was created by ukrainian media by ukrainian people uh, it changed a lot yeah? so it changed fully rules and uh, now olga have license and uh, no handshakes uh, what what is really important rule uh, but uh, at the same time, we see uh, how how bad situation inside this federation, yeah, in the fencing federation, how they try to put uh, interests of uh, terrorists, I would say, yeah, Russian and Belarusian, uh, at uh, like more in the top than, than our interest, and uh, they try to to bring some some disrespectful thing to us. And I see all this situation as a big disrespect to Ukraine and to Ukrainian people, to Ukrainian sports. And of course, uh, it's it's really bad to see uh, such a behavior. Of course, we understand that uh, this federation, especially of fencing, uh, is fully under control of Usmanov, and uh, yeah, and we see result of it. And uh, this such a decisions, it's uh, yeah, I, obviously it's from from Usmanov uh, hands. It's interesting, actually. We have rules. And Olga Harlan won by the rules. And we have emotions and maybe private attitude towards the athletes of other country. And especially if this country is in war with Ukraine and is aggressor to Ukraine and Ukrainians. So on the scale is emotions and the rules. Why the situation ever might appear uh, before the uh, heads of uh, the committee, the heads of these organizations that rules this uh, type of sport. Because this is emotions and this is the rules. It's, for me, it's not understandable. Uh, it's a little bit incorrect because it's also rules. Respect to your opponent is also rules and they have these rules. Uh, but it's not a handshake and, and they don't have word, uh, word as a word handshake. They uh, should say like uh, hello to each other or like goodbye uh, as act of, of respect. And Olga was proposing to do it with, with uh, Sables. And uh, this, this is a difference. Yeah? So like she doesn't want to do a handshake. And it's OK because now we have COVID protocols and you can do it with Sable. But uh, it was obviously provo uh, very provocative uh, move from Russian uh, athlete or like terrorist, I would say also, because she's supporting war. But it's another question. Uh, but at all, yes, yeah, so uh, Olga knows, as I see it, Olga don't break any rules and she do everything correct. And uh, it could be handshake, but it could be also just touching with sables. But Russian athletes don't want to touch with sables. She wants to, I don't know, hack or something like that to make it using in Russian propaganda, as, as we said before. But uh, yeah, but we have what we have. And uh, of course, Olga don't break any rules. And she won her and she should fight in in next round. And it's really shameful that she, she, was, she was out from competition because of this situation. Actually, it's not the first time. It's not the first occasion with the Ukrainian athletes. I want to remind you in our audience that handshaking with Russian athletes has been quite a provocative idea for a long time. For example, at Roland Garros, Ukrainian tennis player Elina Svitolina received a portion of negativity from the French public. The representative of Ukraine was once again booed for ignoring a handshake with the representative of the aggressor country. So on your point of view, why do you think our tennis players were booed because they didn't want to shake hands with the Belarusian tennis player? And why it happens with the uh, international audience, the representatives of European countries, countries that uh, um, have respect to Ukraine and uh, uh, really support Ukrainians? Uh, that's this problem of uh, Russian athletes in the sport. Yeah? So they're using this uh, media stage 
because sport is obviously the media, it's a very big media stage. And they use it for promoting their propaganda, and uh, that, that's a, that's the answer. Because the Russian propaganda works, and through the sport, it works very good for years. Yeah, and uh, we can we can re remind ourselves uh, this amazingly big, huge scandal, doping scandal, where like Russian government was involved. So for Russia, sport is like propaganda tool in propaganda and very strong tool. And this uh, is the answer. So they. Uh, try to fool everyone that sport is out of politics, that Russian athletes are natural. But we see more and more and more that even athletes who was checked by somehow, anyway, they somehow they connected to army, mm -hmm. they connected to Russian propaganda. And as we see, um, a lot of people, even in countries who support us a lot, even these countries as a French audience, they really believe in this propaganda that these athletes are not guilty. And uh, we also see one of the program on Netflix about some Russian players uh, where they also was crying and say that they're, they're not guilty and they're just a victim. But of course, they're not victims. They're playing for Russian propaganda. And that's, that's what we see on, uh, in, on this crowds. Yeah? And Russian propaganda works. And uh, this is a problem because after that, Russian propaganda write about it and they try to convince Russian people in Russia that the whole world supports them. And uh, they try to, with that, they try to convince more and more people become a Russian uh, terrorist zombie and go to the war to Ukraine. So it's, it's how Russian propaganda works. So, and uh, this is a problem in such a case that we can prevent uh, sharing of this propaganda on the international stage. And that's why Russian and the Russian artists should be, uh, should be banned mm -hmm. from all competitions. You know, sometimes the so-called human factor doesn't um, allow people to believe in some real facts. That's why uh, sometimes they use the help of uh, uh, artificial intelligence. So did we. We asked GPT chat. Actually, we asked, asked, asked it uh, does, uh, with the question, does Russia use sports to promote its politics in the world and how? Uh, it's doing it. So uh, one of the interest questions, answers from the GPT chat is the, 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 the following. Hosting international sporting events, for example. Russia has hosted major international sporting events such as the 2014 Winter Olympics in Sochi and the 2018 FIFA World Cup. Uh, these events are used as opportunities to showcase the country's infrastructure, culture and hospitality to the world. World, uh, bolstering its reputation and projecting an image of strength and capability. We know that the war in Ukraine started in 2014, but it doesn't stop the world to prevent Russia the uh, opportunity to represent the Olympic Games. So now it's almost 10 years of war when and how and by whom these rules can be changed, and not only towards Russia, but towards the country aggressor? Uh, so obviously, like, yeah, so uh, war starts in 2014, and we literally can see, and in my opinion, one of the reasons why reaction back then wasn't so loud and why not everyone, like, tried to put it and try to stop it, is because Olympic Games in Sochi, because uh, sports, it was always, it's values of sport, it's friendship, it's united. And whole world was united in Russia in 2014 when war starts in Ukraine. And uh, all media, whole world was united in Russia, in Olympic Games. And now they grabbing Crimea and they lie to everyone that they are not, uh, do have something with that. And it's such a, it's such a trick also, and it's, it's play a big role in my opinion. And uh, also, now full invasion starts when, when uh, after right after Olympics in uh, Beijing, so it's also it's also connected and uh, sport events. Also, I spoke I, I talk a lot with uh, Korean media and they also say like yeah, we was in the world uh, World Cup in football in in Russia and it was amazing. Uh, so and Russia tried to show this fake picture of good life or of some values or something like that. Uh, just to in increase image and then to use it to attack uh, some other countries and to make terrorist acts. And uh, it's kind of, uh, it always was like that in Russia, they always was using sport in, in their politics. 
Yes, uh, this is the other um, answer from GPT chat was actually about the national pride and patriotism. Success in sports can evoke a sense of national pride and patriotism among Russians, as we saw it uh, after the end of the Olympic Games in Sochi, and we saw it just before the beginning of full-scale invasion on the main square of Moscow, where uh, all the athletes uh, of uh, United Team of Russia were proud to be Russians and standing alongside with Putin and still these athletes taking parts in different uh, um, uh, competitions uh, in different uh, way of sports so uh, how can them be checked towards their uh, attitude to the regime of Russia to take part in competitions who can change these rules and is it the time to to make this I initiative uh, it's the time, and it was time uh, to do that, I think, in my opinion, a year ago and one and a half year ago when full invasion starts. Uh, so if you talk about Olympic Games, we have an organization who rule Olympic Games, it's International Olympic Committee. And uh, they now uh, share some recommendations to international federations, uh, but mainly uh, IOC rules uh, Olympic sports. And uh, in my opinion, it should be one organization for every federation, for every international federation. As we have, for example, in uh, doping rules, we have WADA, and WADA check all athletes in all international uh, Olympic sports. So the same should be uh, about uh, Russian athletes who uh, some, somehow connected to the government or not. So it would be, it should be one uh, structure who checks them. But now it's, uh, it's a mess, it's a full mess, because now every international federation finds for themselves some companies uh, and uh, in uh, most cases, it's companies who are unknown companies, so we don't even know with what names. It's just, I don't know, security, uh, some security companies, and they don't even share their names, so it's just randomly. Or maybe it's even no companies, yeah? So, and as we see now, uh, they all this checking stuff going very bad because they uh, allow to compete athletes who support regime of Putin. So it shouldn't be like that. And uh, in my opinion, it should be one organization with strict rules because now we have uh, IC recommendations and it's not strict so like one of the one of the requirements it's uh, athletes shouldn't do active support of war and it's you have straight question like what is meaning active support of war so like mm -hmm. likes on social media and instagram it's active or not uh, also they shouldn't have contracts with army and but they don't say anything about period yeah so they shouldn't have it five years ago, or now, or tomorrow, or when they compete. And also how, uh, and also this this requirement about the contracts in army, how you can check it? Yeah. So contract is two-sided deal, and you have Russian athlete, and uh, you should work with Russian army, with Russian government, or you should believe Russian athlete. It's only it's only way how you can get to know this athlete have contract or not. How you can check it? It's not, it's, not, it's not a good basic for decision. I want to discuss you another one case uh, like this. The International Olympic Committee deprived London of Olympic qualification tournaments in new sports because of the requirements for Russians and Belarusians. Uh, the organization considers the conditions of the British government to be discrimination. This was reported by the Times. Olympic qualification for breaking and BMX cycling was planned in London for June, June 2024. In March, uh, this organization recommended, the Olympic Committee recommended the International Sports Federations allow Russian and Belarusian athletes to compete in neutral status. The government of Great Britain allowed athletes from Russia and Belarus to compete in the country. However, the government set a number of requirements for them to participate in any tournaments. Athletes from Russia and Belarus must sign a personal declaration of neutrality and agree not to support the war in Ukraine, not to support the leadership of Russia, which is waging war in Ukraine, not receive government funding. So please explain us what is uh, qualifying tournaments for Olympics and is this uh, any discrimination in these decisions? It's uh, just another delusional uh, statement from IOC and uh, of course it's not discrimination, so it, it's simply like it's not all requirements what should be used. In my opinion, it's even it's even less what should be used. 
and uh, of course it's it's okay if uh, uh, athletes who want to participate they don't receive money from uh, terrorist state because if terrorist state pay money then they have interest in it if they not uh, support war what 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 is where is discrimination i think all 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 uh, normal human bank should uh, be against war should be against uh, the genocide in in ukraine because it's in, it's not it's not humanity like it's it's is is disaster and we should uh, we should support peace it's it's a main mission of sports and uh, of course this requirements is fully okay it's fully okay and all others should uh, should follow it but on other hand we we have another situation and the uh, wars yes that IOC try to defend they say okay but if others sign this document they can go to prison in russia for 15 years okay another question if they have rule if they don't win competition then they uh, i don't know also go to the prison for 20 years so then we all all athletes should uh, should uh, withdraw and uh, give a win to russian athletes we shouldn't play this game we have this kind of uh, situation something similar when was apartheid in africa so it was a little bit different yes yeah? so it was discrimination to some athletes uh, because of color of skin but also so i can i can rephrase it like some group of people was pressured because of some yeah some because of some like unique and now we have see like yeah okay if some russian athlete against war then they go to the prison so uh, i see it it's a as a big very a very big social problem back then africa was uh, banned from olympic games for 32 years 32 years mm -hmm. and now why why not the same dec decision for uh, russian athletes it's a big it's a very big problem social problem in russia why why now we have another decision it's a good question why it's a discrimination i also can't understand because i think it's fully okay if you not support war it's fully okay if you don't receive money from terrorist state and you don't sponsor to get sponsored from sanctioned companies which uh, sponsored war i don't see any problems with that why i see this, this problem it's a good question Let's look at another occasion and um, doubtful decision, I'd say. The decision of the executive board of the International Olympic Committee to recommend the return of athletes from Belarus and Russia to the competition in a neutral status, because a wave of uh, condemnation. Thus, the Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs of Poland, Piotr Wawczyk, uh, calls this step a day of shame for the uh, International Olympic Committee after Bucha Irpenian Gastomel, after daily bombing of civilian objects. This is a day of shame for the International Olympic Committee. He wrote on uh, the Twitter on Tuesday, March uh, to, uh, 24, 28. And the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Czech Republic, Jan uh, Lipovsky, in his turn said that Russia has no place at the Olympic Games. Uh, this is a quote, we mustn't close our eyes to reality. Russian sports are certainly managed by the Kremlin. He wrote on Twitter, adding uh, that the Czech Republic Olympic Committee will continue to insist on the exclusion of Russian athletes from the competition. More of this, the Minister of Sports of Germany, Nancy Fieser, in her turn called the recommendations of the International Olympic Committee a slap to Ukrainian athletes. So about the differences in the position of the European U Union countries and the perception of the war unleashed by Russia in Ukraine is a separate issue. But if such a loud and massive reaction was from sportsmen and the society of these countries, how is this possible and will it have any effects the situation? Uh, one, one correct, Nancy Fazer, as I believe, she is the Ministry of Inner Affairs in, in Germany. She is not Ministry of Sport, as I, as I, as I remember. Uh, but I fully agree with the statement that it's, it's a really slap in the face of, of Ukrainians. It's, it's not correct. Uh, and such a decision, it was, and it still remains a big day of shame. And uh, we literally see that values are not matter anymore so much as it, as it should be. Uh, sport values and uh, now uh, such a recommendations on all these requirements what we talked before it's not correct it's not correct in sport it should be bright thinking in, uh, and we should uh, try to to fight for justice not for uh, uh, image image washing for some countries with a big social problems 
I mean, the initiative from the athletes might be very uh, effective uh, to change the rules, to push to the Olympic Committee to change the rules, to, to push the, uh, all the international uh, sport institutions yep. to really understand the depth of the problem and the tragedy that's going yes. on right now in Ukraine. Yeah, so I fully agree with that. And uh, first of all, it was spe a special United Nations reporter, uh, Alexandra Ksantaki. Uh, absolutely delusional person, and uh, her quotes was insane. Uh, it was also very popular in Twitter, and uh, I, I asked her some questions, and she was saying, I was asking some simple questions, so are Russian soldiers who willingly and gladly go to the war, are they guilty in this war? And she answered, no, they're not guilty, and uh, they have, they should be, and I say, okay, athletes are part of army, so they could be that these athletes willingly and gladly go to the war. Should they come back on international arena? And she, she say yes, it's fully okay. So it's completely delusional. Some some quotes and and, and so it's it's crazy for me. It's insane. And uh, she is uh, one of the persons who uh, create like legal basic for this decision of IOC because she say, oh, if you suspend Russian athletes, it's a big uh, uh, how it called like human rights problem. Human rights problem in, in for Russian athletes. And I said, no, if we don't accept them, then we save lives of Ukrainians. It's fully okay. And uh, we invite to our press conference Patricia Vieter. It's a very, very intelligent woman. She's a professor uh, in human rights uh, uh, topic. And uh, she was doing her opinion, official opinion for National Olympic Committee of Germany. And we invite her, and her opinion was absolutely different. So she said, it's nothing wrong if you suspend Russian athletes. It's it's fully okay if you if you save lives with that decision. You don't you don't break any human rights uh, laws and everything like that. We invite a sport expert, uh, Mark Ort, also from Germany, and he was opinion his opinion was also like pretty simple that it's it's fully correct decision. Then we talk with athletes and uh, Ukrainian athletes and from other countries, and there was also like we we discuss this basic for this decision. And of course, uh, basic uh, IOC is not, it's very big structure and they have a lot of commissions inside. They have a lot of some, some structures inside. And mainly these structures uh, and all these meetings of IOC was attended by some Russian uh, sport representatives who have military ranks. So colonel Russian army, he is head of uh, Russian Olympic Committee, Stanislav Poznikov. And he was attending to all meetings. So literally, I see when they take this decision, they was listening to colonel of Russian army. And it, it's fully, it, it, it's crazy, like how you can listen when you take these decisions to colonel of Russian army, he's terrorist. And also in time of full invasion already, he was, uh, it was uh, his quote, uh, propagandist quote, that it's a big honor for Russian atlas to take part in special military operation in Ukraine. So he's promoting war. And they listen to his uh, opinion and his thoughts about this topic. It's crazy. It's but, insane. But why, why, do you, why, why do you think that uh, the speech of colonel once can change the opinion of smart people as you represented uh, the uh, persons who attended uh, these meetings and uh, these press conferences? One opinion of the colonel. No. And it no, shakes, no, no. All, the, opinion... it shakes all the uh, obvious uh, normal facts in the heads of uh, such uh, uh, intellectual people. Yeah. Why? No, no, uh, press conference will make it after a decision of IOC. So it was it was an independent conference. I was like, uh, tried to, to do it. Uh, so like, it was just our reaction on decision and why its decision is not right, why it's wrong. And uh, IOC is very big, so it's worldwide, uh, it's worldwide uh, organization. And uh, in some, we understand and we, we should understand that Russian propaganda is very strong and it's very big and it's very deep. In all over the world, and they have a lot of support from African countries, as we see it on uh, on a political level. It's the same in sports. They have a lot of uh, support from Asian countries, and uh, of course, somehow they have influence on on IOC, on a, on even on executive committee of IOC, and uh, they push this decision. And uh, in some point, yes, yeah, so maybe from our side, from Ukrainian side, from our organizations, maybe we did not not enough. But also, as I say, uh, it's very strange that they listen to such a thing, such a basics for this decision, 
and why they don't talk uh, some logical opinion as a basic. So it's a good question. Uh, but as I, as I think till now, we can change everything because it's not a final decision. It's no final decision for Olympic Games. And uh, we should work more and we should create more pressure and then we can change everything. I was also always grateful for Ukrainian audience because if no Ukrainian people know, know me as an as athlete, because I, I am competing to make my country proud, to represent my country on the international stage, and uh, also all financial, um, uh, I would say like sponsoring from government. It's uh, obviously it's, it's money for of people, of Ukrainian people, it's from taxes. And uh, of course, it's uh, important to also work for Ukraine and uh, defend Ukraine on every stage and do everything what you can to defend your country. And uh, it's uh, it's really shameful that Lomachenko uh, have uh, such a bad position. Yeah, I would say he tried to try to uh, try to defend uh, some uh, Russian devils uh, who, who try to present as a, as a, as a charge. Uh, Bubka, who have uh, this business, and he can't even comment uh, and make some comments about what's going on. Uh, at the same time, we have Klashkova, who is fully natural, so we don't hear anything about uh, her. And of course, it's really bad that these athletes with uh, big names, uh, with a big audience, with uh, huge names, they can they can speak out and, and talk that Ukraine needs support, that the war should be stopped, that Russia is terrorist state, and that, that it's a legal war, it's genocide, and we need more support. Of course, it's, it's really bad that we don't... Uh, have uh, this from, from uh, this opinion from these people. But on the other hand, we have a lot of other athletes who really support Ukraine, who do volunteering, who uh, competing, who speak always about Ukraine, all comments about Ukraine, that we need support, and uh, they really make Ukraine proud of them. So, uh, but I would say majority is uh, on the right side of history. At the end of our conversation, I just want to add some more data. Uh, since February 24, 2022, more than 250 athletes and coaches have died. Among the dead are world and European champions, multiple winners of national championships in Olympics and non-Olympic sports. So aren't these uh, loud arguments for your colleagues from different other countries, for, for the top officials of uh, the teams uh, of uh, different ways of sports uh, around the world. What else can be the arguments for them? Uh, I would say yes, so like uh, we lost, Ukrainian sport lost a lot. And uh, first of all, yes, so like we have a bombings, uh, a lot of people, uh, leave the country uh, as a refugees, uh, but we can rebuild stadiums. We can uh, people can come back, but uh, I would say most disaster in this situation is people who have been killed, so they can't come back, and we lost them forever. And it's a great people. It's a great human beings. It's a, it's a champions. It's a, uh, some, sometimes it's just a kids, a small small kids, small girls who make gymnastics or like some small guy who make sambo in like 15, 14 years old. And uh, we really like lost them forever. And it's important to understand that it's not a game. It's not, uh, it's not politics, it's in people's lives. And uh, we lost them forever. And uh, because of Russian propaganda still spreading through the international sport arena, we will lose more and more and more. And uh, we can save a lot of lives if we, uh, if we suspend Russian and the Russian athletes from international sport arena. And uh, I can't I can't find more arguments because uh, what 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 can uh, what can have more values in life? It's most valuable thing what every human being have. And now uh, Russian terrorists they just they taking away uh, human lives. And of course it's it's final argument. If uh, some organizations don't want to understand it, then I think we should boycott these organizations and create another one. Uh, I, I don't see any other uh, way to, to do it, because uh, if people don't respect Ukrainian lives, then uh, why we should be a part of uh, such organizations? So thank you very much for your sincere answers, and thank you very much for your sharp position, and thank you very much for this interview. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to remind our uh, viewers that we had a chance to talk to Vladislav Hiraskevich. It's uh, the first ever Ukrainian 
skeleton racer. And this is how we um, saw the effectiveness of politics in sports still. I'm Ksenia Smirnova, and it was my show, Talk for More Details. And if you liked the episode, press like button. If you didn't like it, just write in the comments why. And sure, press the bell to be the first to see the most up-to-date information. So don't forget to subscribe to the Gaze platform on YouTube and on our social networks. Thank you and keep in touch.